winter 1943, a critical period in World War II. Two of history's greatest generals were facing each other across the Russian steppe. One was Erich von Manstein, Germany's most brilliant tactician. Hitler had a profound respect for Manstein because, without doubt, he was one of the most competent field marshals he had, if not the most competent. Von Manstein was recognized by all armies in the Second World War as probably the preeminent operational commander. Against him was Georgi Zhukov, master of the Red Army and Stalin's enforcer. He's very cold-blooded. He has very strong nerves, uh, and he's prepared to be very ruthless. That winter, Manstein would need all his skill. Zhukov's forces vastly outnumbered him. It looked as though his entire army could be driven into the sea. It's now that Manstein pioneered a new, highly mobile form of defensive warfare. It would temporarily alter the course of the war and become a classic military maneuver. It would also allow hundreds of thousands of German soldiers to have a very narrow escape. Across southern Russia, the Red Army had the Germans on the run. There were some 300,000 German soldiers. But they were stretched across the Russian steppe in a front running hundreds of miles. Against them were over half a million Red Army troops. There was a real possibility the Germans would be routed and Hitler's entire Eastern Front would collapse. But it was not just a matter of numbers. The Germans were up against one of World War II's greatest generals. Georgi Zhukov was a man determined to restore respect to the Red Army. During much of 1941 and 42, it had been crushed by the German panzers. City after city had fallen to Hitler's forces. The Soviet army had been humiliated. But at Moscow, things had changed. Zhukov had made a stand. Here, in the autumn of 1941, he'd massed his troops and held off a determined German attempt to seize the capital. The German advance was checked. It had turned Zhukov into a national hero. Evan Maudsley has written extensively about the Red Army during World War II. With that victory at Moscow, he suddenly becomes a kind of poster boy of the Red Army. He gets his picture on the front page of, of Pravda as a key military leader, and Moscow establishes him as, the, as, as a victorious general. Nine months later, Zhukov pulled off a second, even bigger victory. For months, the huge industrial city of Stalingrad, on the banks of the river Volga, had been besieged by German forces. Tens of thousands of Soviet civilians faced a brutal death. But then Zhukov was sent to take command. In November 1942, in total secrecy, he assembled a massive force. In a brilliant tactical maneuver, he launched a series of flanking movements that smashed through the German lines. 
Now, instead of the Russians, it was the Germans who were trapped. It would turn into Germany's biggest defeat of the war so far. One hundred thousand German soldiers were taken prisoner. Zhukov became Stalin's most trusted general. Zhukov is effective leader of the Red Army, certainly um, from, from the middle of 1942 onwards. He's someone who Stalin uses, who Stalin trusts. He is prepared to be very ruthless. He shoots division commanders if they've retreated without orders. And that does win Stalin's approval. Zhukov's victory at Stalingrad halted the German advance through southern Russia. It was a turning point in the war on the Eastern Front. Now it was the Germans who were on the run. Major General Mungo Melvin is an expert in tactical and strategic warfare. The map here shows the strategic situation on the Eastern Front. Soviet forces pushed the German forces back to this front line. The Germans have been suffering heavy casualties all the way back from Stalingrad. Now, in February 1943, Zhukov went on the offensive. Stalin orders offensives to be mounted in the general direction of Kharkov and Kiev and across the Don Basin to the lower Dnieper. Meanwhile, continuing the offensive from the Caucasus to effectively close the crossing at Rostov and Don. The German southern wing on the Eastern Front is in dire danger of collapsing. Zhukov's plan was to drive the Germans out of the cities of Kharkov, Belgorod and Rostov trap them against the Black Sea, and then wipe them out. As the Red Army advanced, it didn't just have a great general with vastly superior forces. It was also better equipped. The famous Russian tank is the is a T-34. It's heavily armed, uh, it's heavily armored, it's fast. It's reliable, it works effectively on, on, in bad roads and in, in, in bad conditions. The Russians also had the terrifying Katusha multiple rocket launcher. German forces in southern Russia were in deep trouble. But they had one hope. Zhukov was not the only great general on the battlefield. For over two years, Erich von Manstein had been behind some of Hitler's most successful operations. Richard Overy, is a historian of World War II. Manstein was in many ways the typical Prussian officer. Extremely thorough, efficient, very professional. He had a military character and ethos uh, deeply ingrained in his veins with a great sense of German honor and tradition and discipline. He took soldiering very seriously as part of his life. Autumn, 1940, Manstein had masterminded Hitler's invasion of Western Europe. The Allies had expected a direct attack through the flat, easy terrain of the Low Countries. 
but Manstein had wrong-footed them. He'd sent fast-moving panzer divisions through the heavily wooded Arden Hills in a wide encircling movement that had cut off the Allied front lines. It was the last thing the Allies had expected. The Manstein plan took the French and the British completely by surprise. They looked at the Ardennes forest uh, and they said, nobody's going to be able to get through that. We're going to be attacked through uh, the Low Countries. Uh, and that's what they waited for. And of course, it's precisely what Manstein realized. France had fallen to Manstein's plan in just weeks. The success of the campaign saw him promoted to full general. Ten months later, he was a leading commander in the German Blitzkrieg that stormed across Soviet Russia in the summer of 1941. Once again, the attack relied on fast-moving panzer divisions that simply overran the Russian defenses. Within months, Manstein had pushed through to the Black Sea. February the 6th, 1943. Von Manstein left for Germany for urgent talks with Hitler about what to do. A German account captures the drama of the meeting. Manstein reported that Germany had two options. The Supreme Command must either provide extra troops or Hitler must allow his armies to retreat to more defensible positions. But to Hitler, retreat was unthinkable. First, he regarded the huge coal fields around Donetsk, known as the Donbass, as critical to the German war effort. The Donbass is a major industrial region. It's important to the Germans who want to hold it for their own purposes and to deny it to the Russians. And it's important to the Russians because they want to liberate it. So it's, it is an area of, of considerable importance. But Hitler was also vehemently opposed to the very idea of giving ground. It's not what a true German should do. For him, this was always a psychological question, you know, if you retreated, you were a coward. If you moved forward, then you were, you know, an effective German soldier. Um, and simplistic though that was, he applied it as often as he could to his view of the battlefield. To Manstein, of course, this was complete nonsense. What determined the success on the battlefield was the position of your troops, the supply of weapons and, uh, and new equipment. And, of course, above all, being willing to withdraw, if it was necessary to withdraw, uh, if only to prepare the ground better for an attack. For Manstein, it was a dark moment. By 1943, Manstein was 56 years old. He'd been roughing it at the front for nearly two years. Three months earlier, his eldest son, Gero, had been killed near Leningrad. This was a terrible blow to Manstein. This was probably the hardest thing that ever happened to him in his life. Visitors to his headquarters said that Manstein had become very quickly very old. Lieutenant General Simon Mayl has served in Northern Ireland, the Balkans and the Middle East. He knows what it's like at the front. He will not have been sleeping well. He will not have been uh, eating well. He will be tired. Uh, he will have enormous psychological burdens. A very, very lonely time. And conscious that if he fails, he could see the complete destruction of the German army in the south of Russia. To make matters worse, Manstein had never joined the Nazi party and had an uneasy relationship with Hitler. 
Munstein, like I think quite a lot of the uh, senior military, kept their distance from Hitler and from the Nazi party. Uh, they were happy enough, of course, in the end to, to win victories for Germany, but they didn't see it as a victory for Hitler. And I think that always produced a certain tension. I think Hitler knew that Munstein was somebody who saw through him. Manstein told friends he felt he was fighting a war on two fronts. Hitler behind him, Zhukov in front. It was an exhausting process. When a senior commander, such as Manstein, begins to feel that he's no longer held in the confidence of the political leadership, then that becomes very eroding, and that undermines really the ability to get on with the job. And it wore him down. Back in the field, Manstein told Hitler's chief of staff, Inform the Führer once more that I really must have freedom of maneuver in order to command. He always thinks that I demanded only to be able to retreat more quickly. The opposite is the case. He signed off. If the Führer doesn't trust me, then he must seek another. But his appeal for greater freedom of action fell on deaf ears. February the 9th, 1943, Zhukov's offensive was in full swing. Russian forces recaptured the city of Belgorod. Soon, they were closing in on the city of Kharkov from three sides. It was an important prize the second biggest city in Ukraine. On February the 13th, Hitler issued orders to hold it at all costs. Thousands of German troops attempted to defend it. But Zhukov's Russian forces poured in men and firepower. The weather turned bitterly cold. The Germans were outgunned. There was a risk they'd be wiped out in a hopeless defense of the city. Manstein took a desperate decision. He deliberately disregarded Hitler and ordered a withdrawal. He commented acidly, the army group had no intention of sacrificing an army for Kharkov. By February the 16th, the withdrawal was complete and the Red Army was in charge of the city. Kharkov is a really important symbol of the industrial Ukraine. So when, when, when it's recaptured by uh, the Red Army, it is a major, uh, a major success and a major setback for the Germans. Zhukov's soldiers now scented victory. By mid-February, the Russian spearheads had pushed over 200 miles into German-held territory. As the Germans retreated, they did everything they could to hold back the Russian advance. They blew up bridges, buildings and airfields. Roads and railway lines were destroyed. It was a brutal policy of scorched earth. Yet ironically, it prodded the Russians into even greater efforts. When Soviet soldiers came across ruined villages, there's no doubt that this, this fired them up to do what the Soviet propaganda was telling them to do, which is you know, to kill as many Germans as you, as you could. The Germans were playing into Zhukov's hands. All he needed to do was keep going. 
and his plan to push the Germans into the Black Sea would be complete. Von Manstein would need all his brilliance to save the situation. February the 17th, Hitler flew to von Manstein's headquarters on the Dnieper for another emergency meeting. An eyewitness account of Hitler's arrival with his dog Blondie recorded. I discovered with a shudder that Hitler had very bad breath. As I took his coat, there was a savage outburst from the Alsatian bitch. I hung the coat on the clothes stand, and I could have sworn that in the pockets there were two pistols. For three days, Hitler and Manstein argued. Hitler demanded an instant end to the retreat and that Kharkov be retaken. But Manstein, convinced the Germans had neither the troops nor weapons, suggested an alternative. The only problem, it ran directly counter to Hitler's wishes. Manstein's plan was a sudden and powerful transition from retreat to attack. It's known as elastic or mobile defense. If you withdraw strategically from concentrate your forces, make sure they're being effectively supplied, don't overcommit yourself, then you are the one able to choose the moment where you re-engage again and you turn your defense into attack. It's rather like chess. You are not looking just at the first two or three moves. You are looking to your opponent's game plan and developing a superior a set of moves against him. So in some ways, you might appear to be losing. You might be withdrawing. And just at the moment when he believes he is winning, you then unleash a vicious counterattack that knocks him completely off balance. Manstein explained the idea to Hitler in some detail. What he wants to do, and this is the plan he gives to Hitler, is to pull the German line back onto the river Dnieper and give ground to lure the Soviet forces into a killing zone of his own choice, making them overextend and be prepared to lose the Donetsk Basin. This would set the conditions for a counter-attack in two stages. One, to recover Kharkov, and secondly, to crush the Russian forces against the Sea of Azov. With this type of powerful counter-offensive, Manstein believes he can defeat the Soviet spring offensive and start to set the conditions for a stalemate, if not a draw, on the Eastern Front. But Hitler hated the whole idea. He still hadn't grasped the concept of a strategic retreat. Forward towards the river Dnieper, it was beginning to outrun its supply lines. Allied aid, in the form of tents, blankets, food and radios, was pouring in. But the Russian commander, Georgi Zhukov, faced a dilemma. How far and fast should he advance before his forces became overextended and vulnerable to a counterattack? Supply depots were now hundreds of miles in the rear. I think the problem which the Russians have is that it's really a very long way. Uh, they haven't got the kind of mood of transport required to maintain the, the momentum. 
the more the Germans pull back, the less acute their supply problems become. The more the, the Russians advance, the worse the worse theirs become. So logistics, uh, supply problems are a key a key feature of these battles. For Zhukov, it was a difficult balancing act. Stalin wanted him to push forward and crush the Germans. But Zhukov knew his supply lines were at breaking point. Finally, he decided to press home the attack. As he did so, he drew comfort from the thought that he was chasing a retreating and defeated army. The Russian advance is a gamble to the extent that they stretch their supply lines. The further forward they race uh, in an attempt to win this gamble, the more they weaken their own forces. As Yukov surveyed the situation, one question dominated his thoughts. Was he in danger of overplaying his hand? On February the 19th, Manstein laid his trap. It started with a series of tactical retreats. The main Russian attack, Operation Gallup, continues to push in a southwesterly direction, threatening the key crossings of the river Dnepr, including the one at Manstein's own headquarters at Zaporizhzhia. A thin line of German forces is insufficient to hold that offensive. Manstein, just in time, manages to get the SS Panzer Corps out of Kharkov, ready to form a hard shoulder here around Krasnograd. It was phase one of Manstein's trap. He concentrated some of his forces on Zhukov's northern flank. Their job would be to slow the Russian advance. Meanwhile, the last German forces are coming from the Caucasus and he's able to assemble the main attacking force here to the south of the main Russian offensive. Their task would be to punch through and destroy Zhukov's main attack. The maneuver was an extraordinary feat of logistics. Moving an army, which is in the region of nearly 100,000 people, with X thousand tanks, uh, X thousand uh, soft skin vehicles, vast amounts of supplies in the middle of an absolutely ferocious uh, Russian winter is a feat of logistic genius. By the evening of February the 19th, the trap was set. The Germans were now concentrated on both flanks of the Russian spearhead. Both Zhukov and Manstein were embarking on one of the biggest gambles of their lives. Whoever won would shape the war on the Eastern Front for the foreseeable future. On February the 20th, 1943, Manstein sprung his trap. He moved from defense to offense. After weeks of defending, it was a welcome change. The first force moved down from Krasnograd to attack the Russians' northern flank. That involves a minor attack in this direction here to slow down the main Soviet offensive, whilst the mass of his army group attacks in a northerly direction to defeat these Soviet forces.
Manstein's aim was to make up for his lack of numbers by concentrating all his forces on Zhukov's weakest points. He knew the Red Army's crack divisions would be at the front of the spearhead. Further back, the men would be less experienced. The fighting was fast and furious. Zhukov had a reputation as a man who had never lost a battle. It was a tough battle, uh, because by this stage, of course, the Red Army had its tail up. But the Russians were caught by surprise. With their most experienced forces up at the front, they had nothing to respond with. It's difficult for the Russians. They have to change their assumptions about whether the German army is broken or not. And the answer seems to be, no, it's not. The, the, the Germans ha are, are more resilient than we had originally hoped. The Germans also had the new Tiger tank. It was more than a match for the Russian T-34. German bombers caused terrible destruction to the Russian lines. The Russians started to run short of fuel and ammunition. Their tanks, in particular, urgently needed repairing. But the repair units were miles from the front lines, too far to be helpful. Desperation, Zhukov's forces hurled themselves forward, though they were fast running out of everything. I think that one of the Russian shortcomings is they don't expect the Germans to be able to regroup as effectively as, as they do. By the evening, the exhausted Russian armies disintegrated. Whole units were rounded up and taken prisoner. Zhukov had been beaten. Soviet losses on the southern front were substantial in the uh, Manchurian counteroffensive. It was a real blow to the Red Army. The Germans would later claim to have counted 23,000 Russian dead on the battlefield. and to have captured thousands of Russian prisoners. It had been a stunning reversal of fortunes. But Manstein was not finished. With Zhukov's troops shattered and in retreat, Manstein pressed home his advantage. His forces now returned to Kharkov. By March the 10th, the Germans were in the northern suburbs of the city. For three days, there was vicious house-to-house -house fighting. German aircraft and tanks pushed forward, trying to reignite the traditions of the initial Blitzkrieg attack. Uh, German aircraft pounded the Soviet positions in Kharkov. Destroyed what was left of an already crumbling city. Three days later, the Russians pulled out. Kharkov was captured. Very large numbers of uh, Soviet soldiers once again fell into German hands. Uh, the Germans pushed forward uh, themselves now very rapidly. Um, and the Soviet um, offensive fell apart. Three days after that, Manstein's forces retook Belgorod. 
But by the time they reach Belgorod, the German army has run out of puff. The rains have come, and all armoured and wheeled movement grinds to a halt. As the spring thaw set in, military movements became impossible. The two sides were deadlocked. But it had been a stunning victory for Manstein. A man known for his mastery of Blitzkrieg had pioneered a new, highly mobile kind of defense. For hundreds of thousands of German soldiers in danger of being trapped at the Black Sea, it had been an extraordinarily narrow escape. Some historians have estimated von Manstein's elastic defense may have significantly prolonged the war. Manstein's uh, ability to conduct a huge battle of maneuver and counter maneuver, in my estimation, delayed the end of the war an absolute minimum of three or six months, perhaps a year. <laughs> But in Germany, von Manstein's constant rows with Hitler had taken their toll. His willingness to give up territory had run counter to all Hitler's instincts. There was still an uneasy relationship between him and, and Hitler. Uh, I think that Hitler always realized that, that Manstein understood the battlefield, could manage the battlefield much more effectively than he could. May the 7th, 1945. The Nazis surrendered. Nuremberg, Germany, once the holy city of Nazism, becomes the setting of an epic event. Here, under the vigilant eyes of Allied military police, the 20 most important surviving members of the Hitler gang go on trial. One of the men who would face trial was Erich von Manstein. But unexpectedly, he'd got fans on the Allied side, where he was seen as a professional soldier, but not a Nazi. Extraordinarily, he is defended by a Labour uh, member of Parliament, George Paget, who speaks up very firmly on his behalf. Uh, many, many of Manstein's uh, subordinates come forward in his defence. Winston Churchill pays into a fighting fund for Manstein's defense. Manstein is tried on 17 counts. Uh, he is cleared on eight uh, and convicted on nine of them. He was sentenced to 18 years prison, later reduced to 12. Meanwhile, the world moved on. The Second World War was replaced by the Cold War. Soviet and Western forces faced each other across an iron curtain. On the eastern side, Manstein's old enemy, Marshal Zhukov, now Minister of Defense, amassed a huge Red Army. It vastly outnumbered NATO's forces in the West. There was a very interesting uh, parallel between the situation facing NATO in Germany in the Cold War and that which had faced German forces on the Eastern Front. There was a massive Soviet force uh, stood by to launch uh, an attack on NATO. The best way to deal with that attack would it be to develop some form of mobile defense. It was now Western leaders turned to the one obvious expert, Erich von Manstein. After serving only four years of a 12-year jail sentence, he was released. Manstein, 
the genius behind the invasion of Western Europe in the name of fascism, became the defender of Western democracy. Because he'd been able to distance himself, in a sense, from the, the nastier aspects of the Third Reich, and because it was clear that he'd played a very important part in the operational successes of the German armed forces, uh, the West was very interested in what he had to offer. Over the following years, Manstein would become an advisor on NATO's defense against the Red Army. I've uh, unearthed quite a lot of evidence of war games and other material that showed that NATO had looked very carefully at what Manstein had done, particularly in his counterattack at Kharkov in 1943, as a model uh, for the type of counterattacks that might be mounted. Zhukov would later call von Manstein a worthy opponent. When the war was over, Zhukov said, the one person I, I really regard as a, as a capable opponent was Field Marshal Manstein. Today, the tactics Manstein hammered out over half a century ago are still studied in military colleges, where they're regarded as not just a preeminent example of defensive strategy, but also the reason for one of the great narrow escapes of World War.